Prayer can be broken down into three separate aspects. Supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. These three facets of prayer are instrumental in a Christian's daily walk. We never know what we're going to encounter. Pastor Terry will break down each of these areas of prayer as he brings to close our current series, The Spirit Formed Summer. Today's sermon is entitled, Prayer That Intervenes and Reverses. Let's join Terry as he concludes this series. Well, this is our, our uh, banners. They fell down. They got tired, whatever. <laughs> but we've been on it all summer. It's called A Spirit Formed uh, Summer where God is working on our lives. And so today I want to come to a conclusion. And lately, the last several weeks, we've been talking about the Lord's Prayer. Amen? The Lord's Prayer is powerful. It's a pattern to how we should pray and how we can have victory in our lives and how we can see results. And when a Christian knows what they can do and what they have, it's amazing the results that come of it when they put it into practice. You know, God gives it to us for a reason that we could be victorious as a church and victorious as individuals. And that's what God wants for every one of our lives, to be victorious. Can I tell you that? Today you may feel defeated. God says, I want to give you victory. I want to give you victory. And so that's what we're going to talk a a little bit about today. The Lord's Prayer calls us to expand our life and and the knowledge of Jesus, expand our life into the practical things of the Holy Spirit, such as worship, petition, when we go to God and ask for things, thanksgiving and warfare. That's what it's all about. I want to read to you a scripture, and it's found in Ephesians 6, 18. It says this. Now, this is Paul, and this is something in this scripture here we're going to see today how uh, another dimension of prayer. Like I said, you could talk about prayer until Jesus comes because it's just so so many facets to it, and God has has so many hidden gems in that thing that we could just feed on it all the time. But listen to this. This is Paul saying, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. In this scripture, it points to the way, three ways of prayer. First one is this. It says, uh, click the screen. It says, praying always with all prayer. Praying always with all prayer. What's he talking about? There's, there's lots of prayers God wants us to do. There's all kinds of prayers. Just like when you go into warfare, You have different weapons, those, you know, they have different types of machine guns, different types of guns, different mortars, different tanks, whatever it may be. There's different prayers in our lives and for different seasons that God says, I want you to pray this way. I want you to pray this way. I want you to pray this way. And when we hit the enemy with every single thing we've got, everything that that the Bible gives us, we pray in that way and we can have victory. Lots of times as Christians, we, we have one prayer and we stick with it. And then God says, look, I want to grow you. I want to give you more. Because there's different kinds of things out there, different kind of enemies you're going to be facing today. And you need a different weapon for that thing. So Paul here is encouraging us to say, number one, pray with all prayers, such as worship, petition, thanksgiving, and warfare. These are type of prayers. The second thing we learn is supplication. Supplication is that we're holding on to the promises that's contained in the Bible for us. We, th- those are promises for us. And we hold on to them and we believe that, man, our prayers are a little more dynamic in what God has called us. And the third thing is in the spirit in the spirit. God wants to give us supernatural uh, insurance that we can get things done. He wants to give us supernatural assistance from God in our prayers. So Jesus taught, first of all, all prayers are relational. We pray to God. We talk to God. Little P person to the capital P person. That's what prayer is all about. It's relational. It's not mechanical. God does not want us to pray mechanical. You've seen people, and I I pity them because they're lacking a dimension in their life. They're lacking power in their life. They're lacking a relationship in their life when they just sit there and they say the same prayer over and over. La, 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 la. There's no power in that. That's mumbling. The Bible even says don't do that. That's dumb. I mean, you wouldn't talk to your children. You wouldn't talk to your wife. You wouldn't talk to anyone at work that way. I hope you have a good day. 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 Whatever, come on, let's stop it. God says the same thing. Look, it's a relationship here. We're talking. Talk to me. It's relationship. And nor is it an incantation. All of a sudden we pray this one prayer and it's just like a spell. No. You know, there are some people, sometimes you see some churches say, pray this prayer, and if you say this prayer this way, then you'll be, you know. Yeah, there's a pattern to prayer, but God does not want us to have incantations. It is not witchcraft. The Bible says this, that we all have a free will, and he will not 
uh, break our will in that area. He will not overrun our will. We have a free will to accept God or reject God. We have a free will to accept the things he has for us or reject the things that he has for us. And witchcraft is the only thing that seeks to control people, and that's satanic. And God does not want us to pray in such a way we're thinking, well, this prayer will give me what I want in that realm. You know what I'm saying? Don't use it as controlling type thing. Other than the fact to say, Lord, I pray if my kids aren't serving you or if my spouse isn't serving you, you make their life miserable until they do. I think that's okay. <laughs> it worked for me. <laughs> Hallelujah. So today I want to talk about three words of prayer. Number one, supplication, intercession, and thanksgiving. Right now, I want to comment on supplication. What is supplication? You've heard that word, supplication, and what we talked about in that scripture there. Listen to this. Philippians 4 says this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And then the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. He wrote this letter to the, the people of Philippi called them Philippians, okay? And at the time, there was a Roman uh, colony there. There was a Roman, uh, what do you call that, uh, Jimmy? It's like an outpost. Okay, that works. Okay, outpost. There was a Roman outpost of guards that were there that would guard this area, that region, and they would, ex uh, they would make sure that the rules were being followed the way the Romans wanted them to be. So there they are. So when Paul was talking to them, and he gave them the scriptures, these Philippians, they knew what Paul was talking about. It says this, when Paul says the word, the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds, well, that Greek word for guards there, the people of Philippi would understand, he's talking about like this garrison, this, this thing that's protecting this area, protecting this area. He says that the peace of God will guard our hearts. So when we pray and we trust God, God's peace comes in and it establishes authority in our minds so that we are not confused so that we're not anxious for things, we're not overwhelmed by things, that in the darkest hour of our lives, we can have peace because of what God does in our lives. Amen? When we pray, we can trust knowing that God will give us peace in every situation of our lives. Paul's saying, if you take a specific stance in prayer, God will establish a stronghold in your mind, bracing you against any attack of the adversary in your life. Hallelujah, and you'll never be cast into confusion. The enemy will not win. Whatever you pray, you will have, whatever trials and needs you have, you will have peace in your mind. So Paul is pointing to a way of confidence. See, when you pray and you have that peace, what happens in your life? You have confidence. The whole thing is this. Paul says, people, I want you to have confidence what you pray for. Okay? We've all prayed many times where we just, I, I don't know if he'll answer prayer. I don't know. You know, just trust God and then step back and let him do his thing. God wants us to have confidence. How many of you guys have ever been in a situation where everything around you just seems like confusion? I remember as a kid, things like, things like that would happen. Usually it's because I'm running for my life because I made someone angry. But the, the situation is like, Lord, give me peace in this situation. Actually, Lord, rapture me at this point. But give me peace in the situation. You may be in an area where you know you're not supposed to be. Say, so God, give me peace here. Help me out. Help me out. And he will come. He will guard your heart. He'll guard your thoughts. You won't be blown aside. You'll all of a sudden have that, that victory right there in your mind. This involves uh, more than just simple petition. This involves more than just simply asking. But he, here he's talking about supplication. And everything by prayer and supplication uh, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That supplication, I want us to pay attention to that word right there. Supplication has to do with asking. Amen? Uh, it, uh, but... It, it means even more. The Greek word there is used, and I, I'm going to give you some Greek words, and I, did, I learned this, okay? Terry didn't discover this, all right? Because Terry can't even pronounce this Greek word. Okay, deomai, deomai. This is a Greek word God wants us to understand here for supplication. And deomai has other uh, words that are attached to it, and I'm going to tell you those. The first one, deomai, means to supplicate, to make supplications, to ask. Not only that, when you read it today, if you look it up, it also means to beg, to pray earnestly, pray fervently. That's supplication. The other root word to this thing is deo, means to bind something up or to tie it up. And then uh, die, I think it is, means ought. What that is, it's a, a moral imperative. What do I mean by that? A moral imperative means like you ought to do something. If you see a fire, you have a moral imperative to go in there and to help someone, to put it out. 
to rescue someone. You have something that you ought to do. When you see a situation that's not the way it should be, you ought to do something for it. Immoral imperatives. So when we bring these three words together, we're going to understand something here that's very powerful in our prayers, church. Grab a hold of this. Make it a part of your life. Because you're going to be able to pray this today or in some situation in your life, you're going to realize God has given me victory and he's going to call me to this. And pay attention to these things here. The order in which things ought to be. Um, now, when you ask, you make your request known to God. But supplication is more of a focused, passionate prayer to God on a certain situation. And when we join supplication, that, that praying there with the recognition that, number one, God has given us victory and trust in God, there's a new dimension in that prayer, a new power in that prayer that God will do in our lives. And re why does God want us to do this? So that we can get that new Jaguar? <laughs> so we can get the new home? So we get the new... No, that's... He says, I want you to do something in the world around you, and you're going to understand this here in a little bit, but you know what? You need to know this prayer and able to come against the enemy. This is all about spiritual warfare. You have an enemy, church. The devil hates you. He's roaming around like a lion, seeking whom he may devour. He hates, he hates, he hates, he hates, and everything he touches dies, and he wants to kill you and I. But God says, look, I'm giving you a weapon, and it's through supplication that you're going to have victory in, in your life, but not only in your life, but in the lives around you. Hallelujah. Supplication translates earnest begging. But you know what? When you read that earnest begging, are we supposed to go to begging God? Jesus never taught that we're to beg God. That goes against the whole relationship that we have with him as a father. He's a good, loving father. The Bible says, if you need something with a father, withhold it from you. No, he'll give it to you because he loves you. So what's this begging here? What does God want us to beg for? Are, are we even supposed to really beg? This is a, they're a dynamic, dynamic, something that really happens when we take the uh, results of prayer and spiritual authority that God is giving us. And uh, we will pray over the dark. We could pray against hell and things will happen. Here's what he's talking about. Let me read it to you. It's found in Matthew 16, 19. This is Jesus talking. Ready? And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth, remember we talked about bind there, will be fat bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So we, we see supplication as a, an authority that God has given us. God has given every single one here and a certain authority to do spiritual warfare, powerful warfare, violent warfare against the enemy in our lives or anyone else that we pray for. We are assigned uh, to bind up things that, not, that are not what they ought to be. That's what God is saying right here. Ready? You and I are assigned to bind up certain things, to bind up the enemy in certain areas of our lives or the lives around us. They're not the way they should be. That's not the way God created it. So we're to come in and Bring back order the way it was. Hallelujah. Let me get to you. Let's look at the world around us. Nothing is the way God originally created, is it? We look at creation, and the Bible even says that creation moans. Why? Because man sinned, and sin affected not only him, but it affected the world and all God's creation. You see, before that, uh, man and the animals, they got along. But all of a sudden, when man sinned, the Bible talked about how the animals at that point started becoming afraid of man right after Noah's flood. I mean, there's certain creation, God created creation all to be together. But when sin entered the world through man, it not only affected man, but it affected everything around him. So, hey, a side note to that. When we sin and we think no one knows about it, it affects more than just you. It affects more than just you. It affects this nation. It affects your family. It affects the city. It affects this church. It really, really does. And the devil does not want us to know that. So we have to know that. Look around us. Nothing in this world is created the way it should be. It's fallen into confusion, disarray, and uh, all because of mankind's fall. Now that we see things that are out of order, we notice those things. We realize, you know what? Sickness ought not ought to be here. A crack house ought not be here. Drugs ought not be in my neighborhood where the children play. Drugs, uh, whatever it may be in the situation, divorce ought not be in my family's life. And it seems like everyone throughout the whole line has just been getting divorced. Now it's coming to me and I'm scared. You know what? It ought not to be this way because God did not create us to get married and divorce, get married and divorce. He created us to stay together and love and have a commitment. Whatever it may be that God created and God wanted it to be, and it's not that way, our eyes should be open to it right now because God's given us his spirit. And God says, now I want you to pray in such a way to pray it back the way it ought to be, the way it ought to be. Uh, God has given us a mission possible. You know, lots of times we think, this is just too difficult for me. You know what? God says, no. 
When you have confidence in me, there will be power in you to be able to pray and ask in such a way that it will happen in your life. Hallelujah. The praying church has been empowered by the promises of God to stop hell's advance in any area of your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Mother's right. Hallelujah. It should be that way. Hallelujah. Let me give you an example. I remember one time, uh, Lester Summer, always at Christian Center, and he was standing there, and he was teaching people, talking to them. And as he was talking to them, all of a sudden, someone about the third row started mocking him. Blah, 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 blah. He just kept on going. And finally, at one point, he looked up and said, he says, shut up, in the name of Jesus Christ. And he went back to teaching. Never gave it another word. The person goes, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> He, at that point, says, this ought not to be, so I'm taking spiritual authority right now, and I have confidence in what God has, and what God says, that's not the way it should be, and he's given me the ability to speak into that situation and say, it's wrong, stop it right here and now. Do it. Boom. It happened in that situation right there. I remember thinking, ooh, I can't wait till the ushers beat that guy up, but it never happened. Didn't have to happen. Lester <laughs> Sermon saw that this was a spiritual attack, trying to bring confusion into the church try to cause people not to hear the truth and he says shut up and stop it in the name of Jesus Christ and it happened amen those are things that happens Jesus uh, set the uh, remember that woman who had the issue of the blood Jesus set her free that's not the situation that's not the way it ought to be he says matter of fact listen to the scripture it says this when Jesus set the woman free with the issue of blood he said to her woman thou art loose from thine infirmity woman this thing is not on you anymore it was wrong for it to be on you. It's gone. And Jesus spoke to that situation and it happened. Hallelujah. Binding is not limited to tying things up also. There's another thought to it. See, we, we can bind things. For, well, let me, let me just explain on that a little bit. When we pray, we can bind things. Say, Lord, in this situation where the, there's an advance here, I just, I just bind the enemy. I'm sick and tired of the enemy's having a hold of my life. To bind doesn't mean it, it just, you have to bind something in a situation sometimes to get results. See, when you bind something, it's not bound forever. Later on, it comes back to situation. But when Jesus came in and delivered people to the devil, the devil never came back. But then there was times where he just bound them up, said, shut up. You know, same thing with us. There might be people in, that you know today who are suffering with certain things. And we, we give it names. We give it scientific names. But there's a spiritual root to a lot of the sicknesses that we've encountered and a lot of things in people's minds that's wrong. And you know what that is? That spiritual thing is demonic power working on their lives, trying to destroy them. Amen? That's where it all comes from. It doesn't just happen chemically and naturally. It all happens in the spiritual realm first. The devil's doing everything he can to destroy people. And he'll do it through drugs, he'll do it through pornography, he'll do it through wrong relationships, he'll do it through doubt, he'll do it through anything that he can get his hands on, through anger, through hate, he will do it. So what we can do in that case, we can say, enemy, I bind you in this situation. Right now I'm trying to pray for this person and they're suffering, they're suffering. I'm going to bind the enemy right now so then I can talk to them and give them the truth and they can hear the truth and receive Jesus Christ. Amen? Whatever the situation may be, oh, you're talking about demons, Terry. That's scary. That's kooky. You know what? We may think that, and the world wants us to believe it that way. But the thing is, there's a truth to this. Jesus constantly encountered. But Terry, that was way back then. We have science now. Science is good. I'm not against science. Science and God, they dovetail perfectly. Science is the discovery of God and his power and his might and his beauty and his wisdom and the knowledge and the way he set things in order. That is science. The greatest scientists in the world were Christians and they went to God and they found these principles of gravity, electromagnetism, you name it. And the world will say, no, 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 no. Science and God cannot coexist. Well, that's a lie. Bad science and God can't coexist. But true science and God coexist because it is the discovery of God. Where was I going with that? Well, obviously, I was doing a science lesson. I have no idea at that moment. Uh, what was I saying? Oh, I said, oh, but I still don't know. Um, I was hoping I would just jumpstart my brain there. But um, binding. binding. Yes, binding. That still didn't help. Okay. <laughs> binding. You know, we are to bind things. There are, oh, I remember now. Thank you. There are certain demonic influences in our lives. And there are demons. There is a spiritual realm. There is a living God. He's in spirit. He has angels that work on our behalf. There are demons who hate and they're fighting against us. And because of those things, demons cause doubt in our minds and fear and anger and hate. Those are the dark forces. And out of those things, sicknesses comes as well. Did God create cancer? Then where did it come from? Demonic influence. 
Did God create uh, minds that could not think on their own? No. The Bible says that he's given us a good mind, a clear mind. He's given us the mind of Christ. So where does a, a mind that's out of, with full confusion does not know what's going on and out of control, where does that come from? Hell, church. I didn't mean it that way. It comes from hell, church. <laughs> it comes from hell. <laughs> It comes from, we have to know this. And if we don't know this, we won't know what to pray against and what to pray for. There are spiritual aspects that we need to know that's happening in the world all around us. And God has given us victory in the blood of Jesus Christ and the name of Jesus over hell. You give God glory. Hallelujah. So God tells us, bind that thing. Don't let that happen in your family. Rebuke it. Fight it off. Be fervent about it. Have supplication and don't allow it anymore. You know, you don't have to be mean. You don't have to be angry. But you could just say, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, rebuke you. I don't have the power, but it's the name of Jesus. And Jesus has the power to rebuke you. Get out of my children's life. You can't have them anymore. They may be following this lifestyle. They may be following the wrong friends. Well, I can just call right now. I bind that friendship right now that seeks to hold and drag my children down in Jesus' name. And I cast them out. Amen? That's spiritual authority. Say it like you mean it. Believe it. Because there needs to be a confidence within us to say, God, you said it. I believe it. I'm going to preach it. And I'm going to say it that way and pray it that way. Hallelujah. That's the confidence we as a church need to have in every situation. Hallelujah. There's another meaning to that word binding. How many of you guys uh, ever uh, are contractors? And someone, you wrote a contract and you, you're working on something and someone held you to that contract to make sure you fulfilled that contract. Amen. They were working on my house, and I'm not going to go in who built my house or all the details, that kind of stuff. But things weren't happening the way I wanted them to happen. It's the first house my wife and I ever built. Probably the last one, too. <laughs> we have been very blessed. But when I went there, I see things. I go, this isn't right. This isn't right. So I would go to the contractor and says, where's this? Where's this? Where's this? I held him. I bound him to the contract in which he and I had signed. He said, you will build that for me. I will tell Jenny. <laughs> he knows what I'm talking about. He has Colleen. All right. <laughs> Satan is trying to construct things in our lives totally out of the line of God's will, the way they ought not to be. Jesus says, you bind that thing the way it should be. You have a certain moral imperative to make sure it gets done. Church, it's up to you. I'm not setting up here and making things happen and do all those things saying, ah, they dropped the ball again. I'll have to pick it up for them. That's not how Jesus works. Listen to me, church. God has given the church the power to pray. God has given us the authority to bind and to lose things. And if it doesn't happen, God doesn't step in and say, all right, I got to finish it for you. He doesn't do that. He may find someone else that he can trust who trusts him. Amen? He'll find someone else who trusts him. But you know what? God uses the church to do his will on, on earth. And if we see hell here, it's not God's will. It's because the church has failed and it's not trusted God, has not followed through. Don't let that be said of this church. Amen? Amen. Who's with me? Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Pray, bind, bind the devil, bind those situations. Hallelujah. Lord, here, here's a good prayer uh, Jack Hayford gives. It says, when, we, when what ought to be isn't happening, our role is in supplication is to pray something like this. Lord, what you contracted for at the cross for your purpose and for your power to save Johnny or to deliver Jody, well, it's not being done here on earth, God. It's not happening. Let your ruling power, your kingdom come, amen? Let your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Lord, as your agents assigned to this case, did you know God assigns us to cases of prayer? And we'll talk about that in a little bit. I say stop this advance in the name of Jesus Christ. According to Calvary's terms, I bind you, enemy, from success in this situation in my family or in this whatever it may be. And according to your will, through the power of Jesus' blood, I loose earth from what you have already willed in heaven, Lord. I loose on earth what you've already willed in heaven, Lord, may it happen in our lives. Amen? That is knowledge. That is trust. That is a confidence in the God who hears and he will do what he says he'll do. Amen? That's all we got to do is trust Jesus. Say, trust Jesus. Trust his word. Hallelujah. That's what we're called to do. Remember, we loose, and we're the ones that loose and bind things here on earth. And nothing happens unless the church does it. 
So if nothing's happening in your home, then do it. And if it's not working with you, you grab someone from the church and say, will you pray for me? Amen? Oh, wow. The devil hates it when you get back up. He hates it when you get back up. And when it doesn't happen, you get back up. You get two, three, four. You get a whole group. You get the men's prayer group on Thursday morning. You, whatever it may be, you grab someone. Let's be real because time is short. And the world is suffering and dying. Grab someone and pray over the situation and bind the enemy and loose God's goodness in our lives. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. All right, the second thing. That's supplication, and it's fervent. Intercession. Intercession. Uh, if you look it up, it's a noun, and it says the action of intervening on the behalf of someone else. Praying for someone, praying for someone else. Let me give you a scripture here. It's from 1 Timothy. I'm going to have to take a drink here just real quick. You know, I'm sure this is the same thing you and I had last week, okay? Oh, well. It's still wet. All right. 1 Timothy 2 says this. Therefore, I exhort first... Um, let me say this correctly. Therefore, I exhort first of all that supplication, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men. I want you to pray in all these areas, all these ways. I want you to do it for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all goodness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of our Lord and our, of our God, our Savior. Hallelujah. We are to pray all these prayers for other people. God doesn't want us just to be so self-centered and so, so self-focused that all we do is pray for our situation, our family, our home, our problems. And then we hear someone else going, ah, well, that's, that's terrible. Sorry to hear that. I'll pray for you and go home and never pray. God does not want us to be like that. He wants us to be praying for people at all times. And it says it right here. And as a matter of fact, it's important. It even says it's starting with kings, the civic leaders. You know, like our president, the leaders of this nation, uh, the Governors, uh, all the politicians, you may not like them, <laughs> but praise God, we are to pray for them. You know, as a free Christian, in, as a Christian in a free nation, I think it's our obligation to vote and also to be involved with politics as uh, however God leads you to be involved. It is, God is not against that, but we're not going to change this nation just through politics. God says, you want to change this nation? You want to change the atmosphere? You want to change what's going on? You do it through these prayers right here. Amen? Amen? That's where our power comes from. If the church would have prayed and would have trusted God and knew God's word and came against evil when Hitler was taking charge of Germany, he never would have gotten any further. It's because the church failed. God puts it on our shoulders squarely. He uses these things, but you know what? The church has the opportunity and the power and the authority to stop that sort of stuff if they really mean it and they get on their knees and they pray. They come against the enemy. They bind him and they lose heaven everywhere. So we are called. We are called to pray for our culture. We are promised that we can influence our culture. We're promised that. This is the church's real role in changing the government. Hallelujah. You may think that my prayers can't do much. My prayers are small. It can't change the government. Listen to James 5, 16. It says this, the effective, fervent prayers of righteous men availeth much. Let me translate that for you. The spiritual energized prayer of an impassioned person seeking God will count for more than he or she can even imagine. Your prayers, when you connect them with God, count for even more than you can imagine, church. What do you mean, Terry? Let me give you an example. Who's ever heard of Elijah? Elijah, let me... Uh, James 5, 17 says this, Elijah was a human as we are. Will you guys just read that first line with me? One, two, three. Elijah was a human as we are. Nothing different about the dude. He may have had a really epic beard. He looked like the guys from Duck Dynasty. But other than that, nothing different about the guy. He's just like every one of us. Hallelujah. Uh, and yet, he prayed earnestly that no rain would fall and none fell for three and a half years. And then when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain and the earth began to yield its crop. This one man impacted this entire region and this entire nation. He did it through three ways. Number one, social. All the people were worshiping God after he, this. What it was is uh, Elijah, he had this big contest. He says, you guys want to worship Baal? He says, well, first of all, I'm going to pray to my God that God would hold the rains. And so for three and a half years, there was no rain in this area. God listened to one man's prayer and stopped the rain. Hallelujah. 
You know, there's other scriptures in the Bible where men of God prayed and God stopped the rotation of the earth so that they could have time to finish the battle. In some cases, the Bible even says that God stopped the earth and took it back a couple hours and then brought it back again. All through people praying. It wasn't because God says, I'm going to do this for you. It's because they prayed. Say, now anyway, back to Elijah. Elijah, he's in this nation now, and everyone's worshiping Baal. He goes, I challenge you. First of all, I pray against, my God's going to hold the rain. And I have to think it had to do something with Baal, because Baal had something to do with other things as well, with, like with the rain and stuff. He goes, I'll show you, my God's got more power over your God. Stop the rain. Boom. Booyah. No rain. It's three and a half years. So he goes, now I want to challenge you guys. So he brings them in. He says, bring all your priests. We're going to sacrifice this bull. You guys sacrifice your bull, and I'll sacrifice my bull. And so he says, take as long as you want. So they started praying. They started dancing, and they started cutting themselves, and he started making, mocking them. He goes, oh, I think maybe your God might, he might can't hear you. He might be sleeping. I think he's on the pot. That's what the Bible actually says. <laughs> he's probably in the bathroom going bathroom. <laughs> you know, so bathroom jokes are great in the church, okay? All right, anyway. He's praying, and he's mocking these guys. And they're, so they get even angry, and they start cutting themselves more, and the blood's flowing, but no fire came down and took care of that thing. So Elijah says, my turn. <laughs> this is confidence in his God. But the thing is, God didn't tell him to do this way. I don't see what the Bible says. It just says, God, I want you to be honored. You know, and this may be a crazy, wacky way, but God, do it this way, we please. He says, pour water on this thing. So they did. He says, pour water again. And they just kept pouring water and water and water. And I imagine those people are like going, man, there's a drought. What are you doing? He just soaked this thing to the wood and it came out into the ground and everything. And then he prayed, Lord, I pray that you would show that you are God above this false God. Amen. Fire came down, burnt the altar, burnt the stones, licked up the dust and licked up all the water. It was gone. That was the power of God through one man. Hallelujah. Amen. And then all of a sudden, you know what happens? Now, he prayed this fervent prayer. You know, he's praying for the nation. He's praying. So what happens here? Now all of a sudden the nation says, God is God. Jehovah is God. We will worship him. Even the king, there's a social change in that nation. And then after that, he says, now go home. It's going to rain because I'm going to pray that it rains. And he went up and prayed and it rained. See, his prayers did lots of things. Number one, it was social. All the people worshiped God after that contest. Then after that, it was also spiritual because the prophets of Baal, they were killed. They no longer had. They said, now kill those prophets. They no longer had authority or a voice in that city anymore. Amen? And then the third thing was meteorological. I mean, for crying out loud, he stopped the rain. We don't have enough faith to pray that sort of way, do we? And I, and I realize, well, he's praying for rain, and I'm praying that it stops. Well, which, which one is God going to answer? I don't know. God may say, does it rain here? It rains here. He can do that. He, he, but whatever the situation that will honor God, whatever God wants to do in that situation, be in tune with God. Pray with God. Have that relationship. He will tell you how to pray as well. All through one man because of earnest intercession for the people. The Bible tells us that you and I have the same potential here. It says, Elijah, say that with me. Top line, Elijah was a human as we are. We have the same potential to change the atmosphere around us. No, no, God may have you pray that it rains, but I think more than the atmosphere, there's a spiritual atmosphere here as well. We learned through Wednesday night that out here, there's four houses that were raided, whatever it may be, because they were cooking meth. You know what? That is in our neighborhood. That is in our life. That is wrong, and it destroys lives, and it destroys people. And we have the power and authority to come against that in the name of Jesus. They may be mad at us. They may fight us. We don't fight them. We just sick Jesus on them. Amen? Amen? Who can fight against Jesus Christ? Nobody. And we pray for them. And we change the atmosphere through our fervent prayers for them. We pray for the children. We pray for the community. And we pray for those people who are involved. That if they don't give it up, that God would take them out. You know, I'm not praying death on people, but some way... It's going to stop here, God, but I pray that they would accept you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen? God gives it to everyone. God offers it to everyone. So that's what we pray. There are two words that show this type of prayer, and I'm going to go over these real quickly. Uh, there's a Greek word and a Hebrew word, and both of them mean the same thing. When you read these scriptures, it means to light upon, to come upon by accident, or to strike like lightning. Let me give you an example. In Genesis 28, I'm going to hurry along here. Jacob is running for his life from Esau, his brother. His brother's trying to kill him, so Jacob's running for his life. And so what does he do? He goes to this one place, he's tired, he lays down, and he sleeps. And as he sleeps, the Lord gives him this vision. Remember the vision of Jacob's ladder? He dreamed, he saw this ladder going up to heaven, down to earth, and he saw angels going up and down it all the time. And then he heard God speak to him, and he says, I have given you this land. 
I'm going to multiply your people so that your descendants will be like the dust. You can't count them. There's going to be so many people. I want to give you this if you, because you're trusting me. And then when Jacob woke up, he says, wow, I didn't realize it, but God was in this place. And he called it Bethel, which means God, uh, what does it mean God dwells here? God is here. God's house. God is here. He says, I didn't know it. I didn't realize it. He didn't know at the time that he was in a place where God had taken him. He thought he was there by accident. And God says, no, I brought you here for a purpose. And I wanted to give you a promise in your life. Hallelujah. It says this in Genesis 28, 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I wasn't even aware of it. What are we talking about here? God may take you to a situation and you've, you're there and all of a sudden something happens. But then all of a sudden, the Lord puts it on your heart. I want you to pray. Say, whoa, I didn't expect to hear God in this situation. How many of you guys have ever been to a place and all of a sudden, the Lord just put it on your heart? Pray for this person. Pray for this, whatever, whatever time it may be. Pray. Be sensitive to God and pray. You didn't come there intentionally to pray for a situation, but because you were there by accident, you lighted upon it, as it says there. It says, all of a sudden, God says, now I want you to pray. You were there to do warfare on Jesus' behalf, on God's behalf, heaven's behalf. We are to pray in that way. Um, for instance, true story, and I've told you this story many times. I'm riding my bike home, and I'm going across the highway, and I thought, I, there's a car there. I thought, well, I'm going to beat, the car stopped for a reason, because cars are coming this way, right? So I thought, oh, I'm going to beat him across. <laughs> so I take off, and there's a car that's coming this way, and they're putting on their brakes, and I fall down right in the middle of the road, in the middle of the highway, two lane. And I get up, and I shake all my way home from, the, from there on out, and I said, Mom, you won't believe it. I almost died. She goes, well, the Lord put it on my heart to pray for you in this instance. It was in a moment that she was not aware that God just all of a sudden placed on her heart, pray, pray for someone else. Earnestly pray, intercede for Terry Baldwin. And because of that, and I'm sure many others, and even for my brothers and sisters, because of praying, because of someone is in a place that they didn't expect to be, but God put it on their heart and they were sensitive, they prayed, and God interceded on our behalf. Amen? Amen. If she would have ignored that prompting, and no one else was praying for Terry Baldwin. Who, God? Who? <laughs> oh, that kid. Oh, no. I, I pray, Lord, you get him. No. No one else prayed, I'd be dead. Because God uses his people. He uses his church. So the next time you're in a situation and you don't expect God, and all of a sudden you have God's voice speaking to you, you're thinking, you want me to pray. I'm going to pray. For, I'm going to intercede in this situation and pray. Every time you prayed and you've never seen results, I'm telling you right now, something has happened. Something has happened. I've told you this story many times. So I'll make it real short. This uh, um, missionary, he was on the other side of the world. Um, he decided to go through the jungle via bike. And on the way back, he came back. And, uh, but uh, as he went back again, he came across this one guy. He says, hey, you don't know me, but... We, tried, we followed you the other night, and we tried to kill you because we knew that you had money and you had taken medicine back to the village. And so we laid in wait for you to fall asleep at night, and we was going to kill you in the middle of the jungle and take your stuff. But when we did, you had 12 guys standing around you, however many guys it was, 12 guys standing around you with guns, and we had no idea they were there. So we left. And the guy gave this testimony to the church back in the United States, and they said, and he goes, and people, there was no one there. And then all of a sudden, someone in the middle of the church, they heard him give this testimony. He stood up. He goes, hey, uh, when was that? He, said, he gave him the date. He goes, that was the day the Lord, I was getting ready to go play golf. And as I was getting ready to play golf, God says, I don't want you to play golf. I want you to pray for this missionary that you're supporting and go get someone to help you pray. So he went and grabbed 11 of his other buddies, and they prayed for this missionary who was across the seas. And God used those missionaries, used those, those prayer warriors to send angels with guns to scare off those people who try to attack and kill. See, you never know the prayers that God has urged you to pray that God has done on your behalf on people's lives. Pray. Intercede. Don't just lift up yourselves. Intercede for the world. Amen? That is a mighty God. Hallelujah. God has ordained that his will happens when we pray. Uh, okay, and then there's one more thing here. That other word, when it says, uh, I'll try and say those words, okay? Oh, Lord, Lord, forgive me. Um, the Greek word is antinachano. That sounds Spanish to me. And then there's a pagan word, which is paga. I can do that one. Paga. And both of these words mean to light upon, to just boom, like lightning, come upon something. Another one means to come upon it by accident. Well, both of these words was, were used there. 
you will come upon something by accident and God will make you want to pray. 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 Hallelujah. Pray. And pray until you feel that thing gone. Until you feel that burden in your life gone. Keep praying. If that burden's still there, keep praying. Because it may be your prayers that's still standing guard over someone somewhere around the world or your family. And then the other one means to light upon. And what that means, remember Saul when he was king and he was backslidden and all of a sudden all these priests of God, men of God, they came to him and, they, uh, and he, he was angry at them because he thought they were making, helping David escape him. So he got mad and he told his soldiers, kill all these priests, strike them down. And all of his soldiers says, we well, ain't doing that. Those are God's men. So then Saul turned to this uh, God, guy by the name of Dagog. I, I forget his name. But anyway, he turned to him and he says, I want you to strike them down. And he was a Midianite. He goes, I'll do it. And the Bible says that he got out his sword and he went and killed and cut off their heads and killed all these priests. Now that's a terrible story. But that one word, paga, was used there to means to light upon. And God says, and God uses that same word in how you and I are to pray. We are to pray that we come and attack the enemy with our prayers. You may feel overwhelmed. You may feel like your prayers have no power whatsoever. But the Bible says that we are to, when you have that feeling on you, you are to attack the enemy, like jumping on him with a sword and start hacking away. And every time you pray, you are pushing back darkness in someone's life or in your life or in a situation, wherever it may be. Amen? So, these are powerful words, powerful things. One is, come across it by accident, you're in a situation, you feel led, you pray, and you pounce on it like you're chopping off a devil's head as you pray. Amen? That doesn't mean you, you can act it out. You can act it out, whatever you want to do, but I, do it privately. But go ahead and pray. Pray, pray, pray. Hallelujah. <clears throat> then we'll go to the last one here. Um... And actually, could you, could you do this with me right now? Can we just pray right now for our neighborhood? It's terrible that this kind of stuff happens underneath our eyes, underneath our watch, and we didn't even notice it. So I'm going to pray. Dear God, please forgive me for my sins. Please forgive me for being so self-absorbed and with my own uh, life and my own problems or my own wants. So, so absorbed by that that I don't pray for or even have a sense of what's going on around me. Lord, you're speaking to your church. You'll speak to anyone who will listen. So God, forgive us as a church. Forgive me as the leader. And Lord, I pray that you just continue to speak to our hearts, Lord. May we come upon something by accident. May we come in a situation and just light upon it, Lord, and you speak to us. And Lord, we will be faithful to pray. Lord, I lift up the houses back here, and I pray right now against uh, the spirit of witchcraft, which is drugs. The spirit of witchcraft, which is drugs, which seeks to control the hearts and minds of people and not give it back to them. That is from hell. That does not belong here. It's not the way it ought to be. Lord, that's not the way you created it. Lord, you created that we would be a watchman for our city and for our neighborhood. So I pray right now in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we bind the enemy, we bind drugs, we bind witchcraft, we bind all these things today that seeks to destroy our city and our watch. And we say, no, not here. Here, not again, not anymore, in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray that your kingdom would come in power and might and deliverance for all those who live in this area. I pray, God, that you would draw them and that they would be saved. And those who continue to practice in that, Lord, that you would expose them. And Lord, that they would be caught by the police in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord, that they would surrender and be saved and set free from that thing that's holding them captive. They don't know it, but they are held captive by demonic influence and power in Jesus' name. Lord, Lord, set them free in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. We declare it, your word and your promises, and we thank you, God. And Lord, we will be faithful to lift them up continuously in prayer in Jesus' name. We realize the battle's not won yet. You've already defeated the enemy, but Lord, we realize the battle's not won here yet, so we will continue to pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what? And one of the things that we want to do on one Wednesday night, we want to do a prayer walk just around our community and around our neighborhood and pray for God's purpose of God's power and God's peace and God's deliverance in their lives. Amen? Oh, wow. You want to get some devils shaken up because some are very comfortable in the homes that they're living in. Amen. And so what we need to do is shake them up, say, exterminator, and start praying against those things and rid the community of those bugs. All right, the last thing, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. The three, uh, the three that we had there, 
was supplication, a fervent prayer, going to God, seeking God, and intercession, and then the last thing that God says, I want you to pray with thanksgiving in your life as well. And it says this in 1 Thessalonians, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We're to be thankful. We're to trust God in the situations in our lives. The Bible doesn't say, in every, doesn't say everything is to be think-worthy. Lord, my house burned down. Well, thank God. <laughs> I remember as a kid thinking that. How can I pray that? That's just crazy. Uh, you know, and God says, I don't want you to pray that way. See, that's the devil. He, he, did, he did the same thing to Oprah Winfrey when she says, you know, I just can't believe in a God who's jealous. Well, she saw it from a wrong, perverted point of view because the devil warped that thought in her, in her mind as well as many other Christians. He's jealous for us. He loves us. And he doesn't want to share us with hell. He doesn't want to share us with things that will destroy us. And it's the same thing here. We're not to pray for things like, oh, dad just died. Thank you. No, it's not talking about that. But it says, in all things. And what it's saying is, when troubles are there, when darkness is around you and things are happening, in that situation, you can be thankful that, number one, there's a God that loves you. You can be thankful that there's a God that hears you and there's a God full of power who will deliver you and save you. You can be thankful that he's there with you in that situation, that he will give you peace. Lord, my sister has cancer. Well, God, I thank you that you will sustain us and you'll see us through this thing. I thank you, God, that you're going to give me the opportunity to speak into her life or whatever it may be. But, Lord, I'm also going to pray for healing. Amen? Everything I'm thankful, God, for this is a situation that, for instance, Brenda Vogel, she went to see her sister who's on her deathbed, who died. But in that situation, she could be thankful in the fact that, number one, she was able to witness to someone else, and now they're saved in Jesus' name. God works. God works on those who surrender their lives to him. So we could be thankful. When hell's fires, think of it this way. When there's a uh, field fire around you or a grass fire around your house, you don't just say, oh, thank God there's a fire. No, what you do, you go out and you get something, a rug, and you beat it. You get a hose and you spray it down. You put it out, right? It's the same thing. When there's hell fires in our lives, we can beat down hell's actions in our lives through praise and through thanksgiving. Say, Lord, thank you. You're in this situation, and I'm going to beat the enemy with this. Hallelujah. Let me tell you a true story, and I'm getting ready to close. Up. If we can bring the musicians up. Um, but listen, without looking at them, listen to this. Um, there was this uh, missionary, he and another fellow missionary, they got to go into this one place that they've never been before. No white man has gone there to preach the gospel. And uh, it was one of the hottest places on the face of the earth. And I forget the nickname that they gave it. But they went in there trusting that God was going to lead them in a certain way. So they went in with their backpacks in the water, and they marched, and they marched, and they marched, and it got to the point they marched for so long that... Uh, I don't know how many days, but the story went, goes like this, true story, that they ran out of water, they ran out of food, they were lost. Could not find anyone, could not find anyone anywhere because it's a place where people just don't go. And so they were dying and dying and, and finally to the point that they were so uh, eva evaporated, out of water, dehydrated, <laughs> evaporated. <laughs> okay, anyway, <laughs> they were so dehydrated. They were dying, and so things in their body was kind of like shutting down. And so they were laying there, trying to rest, trying to be in the shade, and they said, you know what? And they couldn't barely talk to each other. You know what? I think it finally beat us. I think we're going to die here. I think so too. You know what? Let's stand to our feet and one more time give a shout to God who's awesome on the throne and give him thanks for letting us come to this place. Let's give the devil a black eye where it seems like he's defeating us. And let's do it by praise and worship. So they mustered and they helped each other up, he said. And they said, Jesus, you're awesome. You're on the throne. I still love you. You rule. You are God. And I'm so thankful. Hallelujah is the Lord God Almighty. Hallelujah. Laid back down. They gave their last breath for God. All of a sudden they heard us. <laughs> off in the distance. All of a sudden through the brush came this jeep true story and this guy they, they, they heard it so they started crawling out to an area where they could see it and the truck pulls up jeep pulls up stops and he says are you so-and-so and you so-and-so they go yeah he says your god sent me to give you water <laughs> i'm gonna start falling here your god sent me and he says and it wasn't just water it was ice water <laughs> 
they were on their last leg, and the enemy thought, I have you. And they said, you know what? I'm going to black your eyes, both your eyes, by praising my God in this situation because God is still worthy of praise. And in that moment of thanksgiving, in that moment of worship, God gave them victory like they've never had before. And they were rescued to tell the story and give God glory. And this man who heard God's voice says, go in this area with this water. Praise God. All because of the shouts and the glory these guys gave God. God says, in all things, it is my will for you to be grateful and to be thankful for me and for what I can do in your life. Hallelujah. Church, let's be powerful prayer warriors in this city. Let's be powerful prayer warriors for our family and for our lives. Amen? Hallelujah. As you know, you can say, I can thank God this situation cannot master me. I thank God that you mastered this situation. I thank God he's bigger than what's happening around me. I thank God he's going to move into the scene with me. I thank God uh, those something may happen that God, you're going to be, you're going to sustain us in all the situation. Lord, I thank you for your unfailing love. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. And I thank you you're present with me every single step of the way. There's so many things to be thankful to God for. You know, not just the good home, not just the good food, not just because we live in America, but because, God, we have many, many things to be thankful for. Amen? Let's give God glory. Let's pluck the devil's eyes and give God glory. And God would see God work in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. I hope you enjoyed Pastor Terry's message today. If you would like to have more information concerning our church, you can go to www.faithoutreach.cc. On behalf of Faith Outreach Center, this is Roger Vogel saying, God bless.